Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies by Heather Fawcett puts a bit of weirdness into the urban fantasy genre. Not in the sense of like, oh, it wasn't weird before, but in the sense that it's not urban. It's not even close. It's a very pastoral story. It's not contemporary. It's set in the 1800s, like the late 1800s. It's basically a Regency story. It's not heroic fantasy or horror, though, which is which is when you start stepping out of urban fantasies, where you one place you run into. And it's certainly fits into some elements of urban fantasy more than it does to other subgenres of speculative fiction that something like this would normally go into. Like it's not romantic. It's I mean, there's romance, but it's not focus of the narrative in the same way that the romantic interplay between characters necessarily is. Nor is the, like, I have heard people say, well, you, it's not a romantic if you don't have a male lead, male romantic lead who is willing to do violence on behalf of the uh, female romantic lead uh, behalf. And while, our main while the, the male romantic lead does show that he's capable of doing that, that's not even like his first choice in a few in more than a few occasions. So that it doesn't quite fit in romantic in that regard necessarily. If you if you're using that restrictive rule for what does or does not count. So first off, about the title, the story is not a fictional encyclopedia, but rather as Emily Wilde's field journals as she's re she's researching the encyclopedia. In this case, in a expedition into rural Scandinavia. Initially on her own, later joined by her colleague Wendell Barnaby, who she kind of has something of a of a crush with. A come on, anime fans may describe it as being tsundere. She's very like you know, in, in the soon phase part of the relationship where she's like, not, I don't like him. I don't like him at all. In spite of his uh, rugged good looks, charming demeanor, um, his his muscles. Uh, and all these other positive traits that are listed up. I don't like him. No, no, no absolutely not. I certainly have, like, like, it's a very, like, incredibly specific denial that reads very much as you're, 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 you're repressing something. In any case, she also suspects that he may have some connection to the Fae himself. Together, they end up searching for the local Fae court in this Scandinavian island, and end up getting caught in a local power struggle. Now, the chunk me that goes, oh, I should compare this to the Brontes or their, or their contemporaries, Wuthering Heights and all that sort of stuff, and, but I have admit that to my eternal shame as a bibliophile, I have not read anything by the Brontes. Um, I've probably like, actually read the books, so I I have seen some adaptations of them, of their works, and I get definitely get the vibe from those adaptations where the author is kind of trying to capture the dynamics of that relationship of, um, two male, of a male and female lead characters who are romantically interested in each other but are very much trying to put off their romantic feelings because for a variety of reasons, whether it's a matter of... Um, pride and prejudice, so to speak, in terms of personal pride, along with um, prejudices based on either social class or um, in terms of any institutional, mis any uh, internalized, unintentional misogynist views in terms of what women are or are not capable of or that sort of thing. So it feels like a pastiche of that to an extent, of, of that archetype of a character romantic relationship. That said, without direct, is I don't have direct knowledge of the actual books of this period, but it feels like it captures the spirit. It captures how these relationships are presented in work, either adaptations of those of novels of this time, or in this, or how other relationships set during this period are depicted in things like Downton Abbey and that sort of thing. You know, it does get kind of slow during several parts early on as Emily tries to figure out the etiquette of this particular chunk of Scandinavia in less of a comedy of manners sense, but more of a, this is frustrating. It feels like it's there to kind of stretch things out a bit through miscommunication 
um, that ultimately gets resolved by Barnaby coming in and being a profound social lubricant. So, like misreading social cues, failing to pick up local social mores, leading, leading to miscommunications and failure to get across useful information. All that happens in real life, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't make this part of the story kind of a little bit frustrating from a pacing standpoint. I did enjoy the book. I picked this book up for the Sword and Laser Book Club. I enjoyed it immensely, and I've already picked up the sequel and intend to get around to it in the future. So I am going to, like, I like this book enough where I'm like, I'm going to read the sequel to it. But it was a bit of slow going at the beginning. I'm definitely interested in the sequel and the character dynamics of the of Emily and Wendell, and like to see where that relationship goes, either romantically or professionally, or what have you. There'll be links in the doobly doo below for where you can get it either digitally from Amazon or by supporting your local booksellers through bookshop.org. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 